uh, maybe just a little bit about me. I, I actually uh, I actually studied political science and public administration, which is you know part economics. Focused almost exclusively on economics since about 2000 when I started working in the banking industry, and um, uh, since about five years I'm. Um, I basically service the financial uh, industry from the uh, Argumente Fabriek, uh, but I also do some stuff around uh, fiscal and, and social security uh, issues. And um, I publish on and off about, um, uh, about economics. Um, and uh, specifically, I started blogging about the Corona crisis uh, because eventually, you know, we'll have to do, you know, Basically, you know, it started all by as a health crisis, but of course, it's it's becoming more and more of an economic crisis. So we really have to start, um, um, you know, calculating the optimal policies, um, which I started uh, blogging about, and, and parts of those blogs will be in in tonight's uh, presentation. Um, so basically, the perspective I'm taking tonight is uh, basically um, the policy making of it. What, what, what policies were actually made and what are the results of those policies uh, th this far uh, into the crisis? And uh, basically, what can we expect uh, in Corona policies going forward? Those are the three questions um, which I'll try to answer in this, um, uh, in this presentation. Uh, and obviously, you know, what's a Corona policy, right? Um, uh, and I'm not doing the economics part of it, um, or not, the, you know, there's the, the, all the, the, you know, Corona itself, but also the policies, they have an economic impact and there are all kinds of economic policies to alleviate or to mitigate that economic impact. So I'm not going into that because obviously we only have an hour. Uh, so basically I'm only talking about uh, the policies that actually suppress or mitigate uh, the epidemic itself. And um, uh, when we look at those policies, um, you can see them basically as protective rings, um, which, you know, taken together basically suppress uh, the academic. Um, uh, so you know it's it's you know it's like a castle where you know you first you, you know they have a body of water and then you have the walls of the castle and then you have soldiers on the walls etc. So basically, the first ring is basically to simply you know keep uh, people from each other and and keep infected people from each other. So basically, deny access to the to the virus. So we, we've seen that right. We've seen the closing of schools, the closing of businesses. Um, the quarantine, the testing, and then uh, the, the request to isolate, which is basically the, the first ring, the first protective ring. And then the second ring is all kinds of adaptation in your physical surroundings. You know, we've seen this at the, you know, at the checkout in supermarkets where you have this, these, 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 these plastic uh, um, uh, barriers between you and the, and the, and the cashier, and the, these physical barriers have popped up almost everywhere which basically, you know, it's a barrier to stop transmission of the virus. And then the third thing are basically behavior rules. You know, you keep your distance, wash your hands, sneeze in your elbow, um, uh, stuff like that. And uh, of course, there are lots of places where ring one, two, three doesn't really work, like in hospitals or in prison or in police cars or in public transport. Uh, transport and and there we say you know you, you can use personal protective uh, equipment you know the face mask the the eye masks uh, the gloves uh, stuff like that and finally we can basically differentiate by vulnerability right we know the kids hardly transmit it they don't really get it so we can reopen schools so ring five is to differentiate by vulnerability of um, uh, of people. And, and of course, what we see is that all countries have basically um, made a mix of these five rings. Some more in ring one, some more in the others. And as time goes by, these rings are constantly changed. We've seen this obviously uh, also um, in the Netherlands. And the second question, of course, is what is Corona? We're talking about Corona policies, right? And um, well, we know it's a virus, and we knew that uh, in, in, in back in uh, in March. But really, the answer to that question is really time sensitive. You know, the answer to the question "What is Corona?" is basically today differs completely 
from uh, what it was in March. Um, because back in March, you know, what did we know, right? We only saw the terrible uh, images from China with uh, extreme uh, lockdown uh, measures. And, you know, you saw these, 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 these people in full gear, you know, cleaning the streets. Um, but we had no data. We really didn't have much information coming out of, uh, uh, coming out of China. And um, when you don't have data, um, you can, uh, we speak normally of fundamental uncertainty. So you really do not have the knowledge to do a normal risk assessment. You know, it's impossible to calculate odds when you have fundamental uncertainty. You just don't have the data to do it. You just know there are uh, many unknowns. Um, and there might also be an infinite number of unknown unknowns. Um, so you really don't know much. So the only thing that you can decide upon is, you know, is this an existential threat to our society? Are we all going to die? Or it might not be. That's the only, you know, that's the assessment or the, uh, the you know, the bet that you have to make if you're a policymaker back in, uh, back in March. It's really a binary question uh, back in March. Is it really dangerous or is it not really dangerous? So basically, we only saw two approaches back in March 2020. Uh, one was an approach basically based on uh, operations research in, in, in Dutch, it's called Beslisskunde. Um, and the logic goes something like, you know, there's a fundamental uncertainty, but we have strong indications that it might be an existential threat. So we must apply the precautionary principle. You know, we have only one duty as policymakers, as governments, you know, or you know, as a mayor or a governor or even for your own family, our first duty is to make sure we survive. And policymakers that took that turn, basically they went for a hard lockdown. They, they would, you know, if you have these five protective rings, they went for a very strong first ring. Everybody stay home. You're not allowed to go outside. Everything is closed. You can only go outside if you want to go to a pharmacy or to a doctor, or if you have an essential profession. And these really hard lockdowns we saw, of course, in Spain, in Italy, uh, in France, and in a later stage also in the UK, maybe India. Um, and there was, of course, this other approach, which, uh, which I call informed medical guesstimates. I didn't know of a better term. Um, uh, basically, the assessment is, well, you know, Corona, it's not that deadly. We'll be unable to eradicate it anyway. It's going to be with us for, you know, the coming uh, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, we don't think that policy matter much because it's because it's, we're unable to eradicate. It's going to hit us one day or another. And basically, herd immunity is the only way to stop it. And uh, this is approach... Uh, was basically uh, used in Sweden, um, was basically the first approach we took in the Netherlands, even though it lasted only a day. Um, this policy lasted about a week in the UK, and it's also a policy that uh, is used in some uh, US states, uh, obviously in some Brazilian states, uh, and in other uh, places. And, th and these countries basically took a soft lockdown. They didn't do nothing. Um, they, they even also did things in ring one, but less strict. So their focus was mainly on ring two to five, uh, but they also did things in, in, in ring one. You know, for example, in Sweden, the universities closed, uh, high schools above 16 years old closed, but the rest basically stayed um, uh, stayed uh, open and of course in, uh, in the Netherlands you know we're a little bit uh, 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 in between uh, in between the two and and of course uh, it, I call it a guesstimate but it's it's not meant as a derogatory term I mean you can just look you know as, as humanity has had 2,000 years of pandemic experience and there's never been a pandemic that completely wiped us out right uh, uh, on the contrary most pandemics are relatively benign you know, with the exception of the of the plague back in the 14th century, most of them are relatively benign, even though, you know, there's lots of panic and people die, 
they're relatively benign. So it's, 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 it's not a completely illogical approach in my mind, anyway. Um, so those are basically the two policies. And of course, we've, we've, you know, we've had two or three months of experience. So basically we can look at the results already. I mean, of course, you know, the, the, the final results are certainly not in as the pandemic is still going on. But we can, you know, we can take stock of the results of policies thus far, uh, because uh, the results are, are, you know, in, you know, potentially enormous, right? They have an impact on health, they have an impact on uh, on, on economics, and they have an impact on on our freedom, right? A, a lockdown like you had in France or in Spain, where you really weren't allowed to go outside, you know, you really in, infringe on people's basic freedoms and for a long time right for in italy and spain like nine weeks staying at home is well quite something it's like prison uh, and those of you who are familiar with uh, quality adjusted life years uh, uh, we're not just uh, saving you know we're not saving qualities just from people who won't get corona and survive but we're taking qualities from everyone not getting corona, but having to stay at home, right? Because, because those nine weeks that you can't go outside, you can't play sports, you ne you'll never get them back. Um, so even though it's not a lot, maybe it's just nine weeks, but you know, multiplied by 500 million people in Europe, it's quite a lot of qualities. So there are trade-offs to be made. And of course, the first trade-off is, of course, between, you know, you, we have you know, we're trying to prevent coronavirus death and coronavirus, you know, maybe disabilities or permanent damage, you know, when you survive and you still have leftover uh, symptoms. Um, but on the other hand, it might lead to uh, extreme unemployment, uh, to business failures. And we know that long-term unemployment and business failures and all the stress associated with unpaid debts and, you know, all the misery uh, has a health impact uh, in terms of uh, in terms of secondary death, um, but but also other you know like mental issues, suicides. You know, there's there's talk of famine in some countries uh, 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 in the world. There might be more domestic violence. So it's, it's a very difficult uh, trade-off. It's 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 just not a it's certainly not a one-sided story here. And the second part, the freedom part, uh, you know, I've, I've tried to come up with a way to how, you know, how can I, how can I visualize the loss of freedom? And, you know, maybe this is the best way to do that. This is, of course, the, um, I think you're well aware of the Maslow's pyramid, you know, where all your human needs are met. And there are different, different levels, of course, you know, from very basic uh, human needs. To, uh, to higher human uh, needs in terms of love and self-esteem and self-actualization. And of course, what a lockdown does is basically, you know, takes away half of your pyramid. Um, there's the economic damage. Um, um, there's of course the anxiety of not being able to go outside, the fear of the virus itself. You know, you might be separated from your family um you can no longer see your friends hug your loved ones you can find you know you can find a, a partner or you can't have sex with well, well at least not with you know if you're if you're if you're, if you're single uh, it's relatively difficult uh but also you know if you know if you get a lot of self-esteem and your social contacts you know when you get them through i don't know your karate or judo or football or hockey or, or any type of contact sport, you know, you can no longer do them, right? And this is, you know, this is, it, it's, it's not the end of the world, but it certainly does, it does damage, especially if it takes a long time. So, um, those are the trade-offs that policymakers have to balance. And how did the two approaches go? We've only had three months of data, but we have some results, right? Um, and of course, the results are difficult to assess because we have all kinds of data quality issues, as we always do. Uh, and when you're talking about Corona, it's basic, basically because at, at, at testing policies, they differ across countries. Some countries, you know, they test everybody. 
uh, the Netherlands, they only test in, uh, in certain uh, conditions. So, you know, when the results are, are different, it's difficult to compare. And then the assessment uh, uh, differs uh, across countries with respect to what you put on a death certificate. And of course, it's still early in many respects, but, uh, but still the data is, um, uh, is, is interesting. But I'll give you one example of the data quality issues, and that is this one. Uh, of course, we know that uh, every country they record uh, COVID-19 death, which is basically the red column here. Um, but of course, not every country, um, they test everybody, right? So there's a difference between uh, the recorded COVID death and the total excess death that we can also record from death certificates in general. Um, and there's, a, there's quite a big difference. So you see that uh, in the Netherlands, for example, um, uh, recorded uh, COVID death only accounts for, I don't remember, let me see. I don't remember what what is it. Sixty uh, percent, right? Sixty uh, percent of uh, excess death is actually recorded as a COVID death, while by Belgium it's one hundred and six percent, and in Sweden it's uh, ninety-two percent. So basically, this is this for the Netherlands. This is caused mainly because the Netherlands doesn't really test that much in social care homes, and Sweden and Belgium do. Uh, so our official COVID death is probably an underestimation. Uh, so when we want to compare the Netherlands and Sweden, you know, it's better to look at excess death than at recorded COVID death. So with that said, how did the approaches go? We, I have, I've made a little comparison between Sweden and the Netherlands, and we can also make a comparison between US states. So how did the Netherlands and Sweden fare? This is uh, excess death. In the top, you'll find the Netherlands. In the bottom, you'll find Sweden. Of course, the Netherlands had, um, well, uh, our uh, government called it the intelligent lockdown. It was relatively hard. Um, even, I mean, shops stayed open, but of course, all schools closed. Um, uh, the horeca, the restaurants, the bars, they uh, all closed. Sports closed. So it's, it's, it's actually on a, on a, it's not as hard as Spain or Italy, but uh, it's certainly not soft. While Sweden took a distinctly softer approach, and you can see uh, the excess deaths are here, they, they're uh, expressed in, um, in um, a metric called Z-score, which is basically a standard deviation, um, an amended standard deviation. So we can see that in the Netherlands, um, excess deaths uh, started a little bit earlier than in Sweden. It reached a, uh, a higher level at uh, a little over 20, while in Sweden it never exceeded 15. Um, but it also is falling more rapidly in the Netherlands than in Sweden, right? You can see that uh, in the end. And of course, uh, those numbers uh, along the uh, X axis are weak numbers. So basically, excess death in the Netherlands is just a little bit higher than in Sweden, but um, in total over all the weeks, you know, but we can reasonably expect that it's going to turn out roughly equal so far. So hard soft down, soft lockdown doesn't really matter much in terms of death. Um, we can also look at the economic uh, difference between um, Sweden and the Netherlands. We have the forecast for 2020. This is a forecast done by the European Commission. And we can see that um, the Sweden is a little bit better, um, both in forecast and in the actual growth in the first quarter. Um, but it, yeah, this, this is not a really significant difference, right? Because a forecast is just a forecast. And the Q1 growth, you know, we're only talking about the last two or one week of March, which is, you know, it, it might be that it just started a little bit later in Sweden, which is, you know, which explains the complete difference. So there's not much difference here. Maybe Sweden did a little bit better. We have an indication, but we, it's hardly proof. So this is Sweden versus the Netherlands, but we can also look at US states. This is... Um, uh, a comparison between Minnesota and South Dakota to uh, U.S. states, uh, basically in the Midwest of the United States. Um, they're adjacent to each other. Minnesota is a little bit more industrial. South Dakota is a little bit more agricultural. 
Um, and the difference is, is that Minnesota had quite a hard lockdown. They had a stay at home order uh, instituted in March 27, which South Dakota never had. Uh, South Dakota did close their public schools, but they never had a stay at home order. And when we look at, um, at total spending uh, as done by uh, you know, residents of those two states, it's very similar. Lockdown hardly has any effect on spending. But when we look at the behavior of businesses, it uh, becomes a whole different ballgame. Um, this is um, the um, employees at, um, at South Dakota businesses. And we can see that the hard lockdown of Minnesota really has an effect on the behavior of businesses versus uh, the, uh, the businesses in, in South Dakota. So there's a, you know, this, a, this is a big pro for soft lockdowns rather than hard lockdowns. And we can see the same effect in um, unemployment claims. In Minnesota, they rose a lot harder than in South Dakota. So stay at home orders, you know, the Spanish, French and Italian approach where you really have to stay at home. They do a lot of economic damage. So, so you know, the, 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 this, 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 the, the, the hardest part of ring one really does a lot of damage. I think, you know, it's hardly proof. It's only two states where it's still early days, but it, it would be definitely something uh, to follow. And we can see the same uh, when we look at, um, uh, this is basically the same two states, but here we look at uh, the revenue done at, um, uh, at small businesses. So, so, so what we can, what, what happens here? Because we saw that consumer spending, it fell almost the same, right? In the two states. But when we look at the revenue of small business, the soft lockdown beats it, it wins. Uh, and the effect is probably that in a hard lockdown situation where people are not allowed to leave the house, uh, they still spend less, but what they spend, they spend less online and more in actual physical shops. It, that may be what hap what's happening here. Uh, at least that will be my theory, uh, which would be interesting to find proof uh, for. So here the soft lockdown wind. And finally, we can of course look at uh, death from Corona. And it's interesting because Minnesota with its, with its really hard stay at home order, which started on March 27, Minnesota actually has more death than South Dakota. Um, so a hard lockdown is, you know, whether it has health benefits, we're not so sure, right? Like Sweden and the Netherlands, you know, there's, 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 you know, there's very little difference. Of course, it's only two states. It's uh, difficult to compare and the difference is not that big. You know, these are death per 100,000, which is low both in Minnesota and in South Dakota. Um, so it's too early to say. So what can we conclude then? You know, we have these two approaches. There's the soft approach, there's the hard approach or the operational research uh, approach and the uh, medical guesstimate. Well, it doesn't appear to matter much overall. Um, we can probably say that the, that the hardest part, the actual real home order, that's probably very detrimental if we can, you know, if we had to do this again, I would definitely advise against it. I can think that's something we can definitely learn from Sweden um, and from Spain and France and Italy. Um, and of course, uh, Minnesota. So that final, you know, that really hard part of ring one may not be enough. And the second, of course, that we can learn is that, you know, it doesn't really matter much what governments do because people do it themselves. You know, they social distance and they self isolate voluntarily regardless of what governments do. And there's some anecdotal evidence, which I haven't included in the slides, where you can actually see, you know, stuff like, uh, you know, mobility or restaurant reservations actually already start to fall before government policies uh, kick in. Uh, so this voluntary behavior that people exhibit is already enough to stop the spread of the virus. So with that, I've, I've covered the first two questions, I think, you know, why were uh, Corona policies the way they were? So we had these two different approaches and what are the effects of Corona policy so far, which, you know, there's not much 
um, a difference in terms of economics and health. And we can definitely say that the Swedes had a lot more freedom uh, than the Spanish or the Italians. And they will probably have psychological effects that we can learn about, you know, after a couple of more months or even years. Um, and then we can come to the third questions for tonight is what can we expect from Corona policies going forward? What will governments or what are governments likely to do? And I must admit, what I'm about to tell you is something I advocate and, and I've actually uh, done in my uh, 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 article. So it's, it's basically also my preference, but it's also what I would expect from Corona policies going forward. Uh, and of course, uh, so how do you do Corona policy? You know, you, not in March, but you know, in a later stage. I mean, what is what is your process? How do you define policy? Obviously, you identify what are the strategic questions, what are the strategic goals. You get the data, you analyze the data, you develop all kinds of scenarios, you identify uh, all kinds of buttons you can push as a country or as a policymaker. And then you formulate and decide upon policy options. And this is a normal policy making procedure or strategy making procedure, uh, which we can go through for Corona uh, at this point because we have we have a lot more data than we had in March. And uh, so, what does the data tell us today? What is what you know? This is stuff we didn't know in March, but we know today. We know that Corona is really not that dangerous, which is you know very lucky. We didn't know that in March, we know that today. So that's, you know, that's a happy place to be. We know that we build immunity. We don't know yet how long it lasts, but we know that it lasts for some time. We know we've known that since, uh, since yesterday, actually. And we know that uh, Corona is very contagious in specific circumstances and not so contagious in others. So this is what we know. Now uh, I'll go through these one by one and then go through the policy uh, implications. So first of all, you know, my conclusion is, you know, what is dangerous? You know, well, it's just a term. So how do you define what is dangerous? Um, so it makes sense just to think of dangerous as, you know, something that's outside the ordinary, right? Because, you know, life itself is dangerous. I mean, you die from life. Um, so basically, what is the normal risk of dying? Um, well, normally, you know, the, the, the risks are there. Of course, obviously, they increase by age. Um, and um, uh, every year in the Netherlands, about 160,000 people die. Well, it's 150,000 in a low flu year, and it, it, it increases to 160,000 in a year where we have a bad flu. So every year, about a little less than 1% of the population dies. And almost all of them are from some kind of bodily failure. You know, it's some form of disease, it's a cancer or your heart stops or uh, whatever, some kind of bodily failure, which is obviously associated with age, which is the risk um, in, the, in the column by age uh, cohort. And of course, there are no natural deaths. There's traffic accidents, drowning, suicide, murder, of course, uh, all kinds of accidents that happen um, at work, uh, but also, you know, you're just uh, doing things about the house, falling out of bed, stuff like that, which is, um, uh, which is also about, uh, 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 which is also, of course, uh, it happens, but it's a very small part. So I, I, would, I would suggest this is the normal situation and the normal situation I would characterize as safe. I mean, I, I, I strongly have a sense that the Netherlands is quite a safe place to be. So um, if we significantly increase these odds, it becomes dangerous, right? Um, so normally, a normal person, we have, you know, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a chance, I mean, this 0.05% of a non-natural death, these are distributed quite evenly across the ages. I mean, if you're old, you have a little bit more chance of dying from falling, but, um, uh, dying from accidents or in traffic, it's, it's, it's much more related to uh, working age. So these are quite evenly distributed. So a normal, uh, normal non-natural death um, still occurs, you know, five out of 10,000, uh, which happens, which is, you know, on an annual basis is thousands of people, right, for the Netherlands. 
Uh, but still, you know, all that, you know, we don't, we don't even wear helmets, right? When we go out on a bicycle. And every year, 300 people in the Netherlands die from, you know, being on a bicycle. Um, so it's certainly not trivial. I mean, these odds are quite low, but, you know, in numbers wise, that's actually quite large. And it's, it's the first, you know, trying to get some context into the phrase, what is dangerous? So what do we know about Corona? Well, we know that the average age of death of people dying of Corona is 82. We know that 90% of deaths are over 70. We know there's a very strong correlations uh, with having a pre-existing disease, the comorbidities. Uh, and, oh, I see that I forgot to translate the word. We have a very strong correlation with social care. Um, so if you have a VLZ indication, so basically if you live in a social care home or you have uh, long-term care in your own home, um, in those situations, 60% of all corona death um, uh, were uh, in people that had these two types of social care. Now about 300,000 people in the Netherlands have social care of this type. So 60% of corona deaths uh, actually happened in only 1.7% of the population. So if you didn't have a social care in the Netherlands over the last three months, your odds of dying from Corona were actually really, really, really extremely small. Traffic was more dangerous for you in the last three months. Getting on your bicycle was more dangerous than Corona. Um, for all of you that did not have a social care uh, indication. So in that sense, Corona is relatively safe. Um, um, and we know this because uh, in early, uh, mid-April, we had the results of a serology test done by uh, Sanquin, the blood bank. So we could actually calculate um, the odds of corona. And we had the serology uh, uh, seroprevalence, we had it by age cohort, at least for the, it was quite reliable for the ages 20 to 70. So I wrote an article, which was in the Dutch financial newspaper. This table is from that article. Um, and basically we see, you know, 98% of people simply, you know, they, you know, up until now, up until May 1st, we had like a million people in the Netherlands that actually had an infection uh, with Corona. So out of this uh, 1 million people, about 800,000, you know, they didn't even notice. About 150,000, they were, you know, they were, um, uh, they were ill, uh, but they stayed at home. They probably didn't do a test, um, uh, and nothing really happened. And then 50,000 out of a million, they actually did a test, right? So they worked in care, or they they felt symptoms in the in the uh, that were so strong that they felt they needed a test, and that uh, the testing people felt they needed a test. And then um, a smaller percentage of that, that's the fourth column, you know, they actually uh, went uh, into hospital and a portion of those went into the ICU, which is the fifth column. And then of course, you can see the odds of dying uh, of Corona. Now, of course, this, is this basically is true for the population that does not live in social care homes. Obviously, the, most people who actually live in social care homes are actually older than 70, not all of them, but the, the, the bulk of them. Um, uh, so um, uh, uh, basically, remember the 0.05% that you have, you know, the, this, in this final uh, column here, 0 0.05 was the normal non-natural death. So uh, basically, for people under 50, it never even exceeded that, right? It's, which is why I'm saying, you know, traffic is more dangerous than Corona for the under 50s. So in that sense, Corona is not dangerous. It's not safe, but it's, it's you know, it's, 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 an extra, it's an extra danger. It's not nice, but it's okay. Uh, and finally, if you put those same uh, odds into a column like uh, this one, uh, basically, the gray columns are the normal risk of dying in any one year for a person of that age. The orange columns are basically a chance of dying uh, if you have a pre-existing disease. And the uh, blue uh, column are the chance of dying without a pre-existing uh, uh, disease. Uh, and of course, these are risk of corona once you've been infected, right? So, so uh, if you think of risk of corona in total, 
you know, the risk of infection times the death risk uh, beyond it's of course even um, even smaller. And um, um, that blue line that you see at roughly um, uh, zero point one percent, that is basically what is used as a the dangerous cutoff in the petrochemical industry. You know, if you own like a refinery or a chemical plant. And the risk of uh, actually dying in one year from working in that chemical plant exceeds 0.1%, it's basically not done. Uh, basically, the chemical plant doesn't get built or get shut down. Um, and, and this is really the maximum, right? Uh, even above 0.05, uh, it already becomes uh, quite difficult to uh, actually do continue to do it legally. Um, um, so you can see that for people um, without uh, comorbidities, you know, when you use this as a norm, you know, once you reach uh, the level of, uh, you know, 60 years of age, corona becomes really dangerous. And if you have a comorbidity, you know, it's the same above approximately 55, 45, 50 years old. Uh, so in that sense, especially for the young, corona is not that dangerous. Second point is we do build uh, immunity. Uh, we've had lots of studies uh, showing the uh, immunity, showing also pretty high levels uh, of immunity. Obviously, I'm not a doctor, so, so you know, I just uh, go on the conclusions of, uh, of experts in this respect. We've heard um, uh, yesterday from Sun Queen from their second zero prevalence study that herd immunity um, uh, also lasts quite some time. Um, uh, because they've seen the same level of immunity from people they've tested twice um, in, in that month. Um, and we've also had research that uh, indicate there's already pre-existing immunity in quite a large uh, part of the, uh, of the population, which also obviously means that herd immunity may appear earlier than expected. So this is all relatively good news. Um, it certainly uh, makes the case for soft lockdown stronger, um, even though uncertainty still remain, right? But the, so that's why I'm talking about indications rather than proof. Uh, and finally, we've also learned that settings matter, right? That uh, most, the bulk of the uh, infections, they occur in, uh, you know, not outside, but inside. Um, where people are in closed spaces, poorly ventilated, they're in close contact, their places are crowded, and they have to be there quite a long time. There are really nice studies done in, in restaurants in Hong Kong and in Korea, where you can actually, you know, you can actually spot where did people who got the infection, where did they sit and how did the air conditioning work and stuff like that. So basically the, that poster you see on the right hand side is basically the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the Japanese uh, strategy. The Japanese had an extremely soft lockdown. They only um, uh, basically applied the three C's, uh, which you can see here, um, and it's almost eradicated in Japan. Um, so this is everything we know. So what can we conclude from this? Well, we know that fundamental uncertainty is over. We now have data. We can actually calculate odds. We know it's not catas catastrophic for society as a whole. It's not catastrophic in death. It's not catastrophic in permanent damage or disabilities. I mean, this does happen. If you've been in the ICU for two weeks on the ventilator, you're, you're very likely to have some form of permanent damage or disability, but those numbers are limited. It's relatively safe for the healthy under 70s. It's relatively safe for the 45, under 45 with comorbidities. And it's certainly not safe for others, but it's also not a death sentence. If you are over 80 um, and you get corona, um, you know, there's still, a, you know, the, like a, a 88, 90% chance that you'll survive. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly not a death sentence. So what does that mean then for policies going forward? Well, we can have much smarter policies, right? We can have really smart risk-based corona countermeasures based on age, based on comorbidities, and based on setting the three C's that we've seen from uh, Japan. Uh, and we can optimize policies by, you know, we have to still minimize the number of deaths. We have to minimize the economic uh, uh, loss or economic damage, and we can maximize freedom for um, 
uh, hopefully for all uh, uh, involved, but at least for the greatest number of, uh, of people. Let's see, where am I my time actually? Let's see, am I still on track? All right, I'll go through this really fast. Uh, well, this was modeled by um, a very famous American um, uh, uh, economist, um, where he basically the, 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 the continuous black line is basically the, the normal soft versus hard lockdown, right? On the right, there is no lockdown at all, which he calls no control, where you have lots of death and relatively, there's still output loss, but it's, um, um, it's limited. And on the left, uh, what he called maximal feasible control, this is the hard lockdown, where you have less death, but more output loss. And then, you know, there's an optimum, uh, of course, um, uh, in the nadir of the line. And then he, he starts to model it by differentiating by age, and that's the dotted line. And you can see that uh, the dotted line is a lot better for everyone, right? There's less death and there's less output loss. And because it's targeted, there's also more freedom. So the dotted line is even better. Now, I'll skip those. And then, uh, so we can leave some Q&A. So I'll we'll skip those two. And then he does a, an additional uh, modeling uh, where he says, now I'm not just targeting by age, but I'm actually adding it by uh, implementing uh, a test, trace, and isolate uh, policy, an additional group distancing, maybe, you know, different uh, times in the supermarket for different ages or different rooms in restaurants for ages. And you can see it can improve even further. So the smart risk-based uh, policies that are now possible will actually lead to better health outcomes, better economic outcomes, and obviously, uh, more freedom because it only targets very specific groups. So what will then likely be the policy going forward? We'll probably see an accelerated loosening of the of the lockdown because the numbers are really uh, good and it's not that dangerous and Japan shows the three C's is in, in many cases enough. We'll implement the, tra the track, trace, and isolate to keep infections uh, at a low level. I've, I've put in a, a number here, uh, under 10 per, per 100,000 per week. Probably that's the level that we're, we're, we're targeting. And then, you know, the, the targeted approach is really not necessary. If, it's, if, we, if we keep it at these low levels, we can probably do with, you know, we'll probably not allow festivals and... Um, uh, really big gatherings, but uh, any gathering under 300 or so uh, is probably uh, doable uh, at a relatively um, uh, near point in the future. But if, God forbid, hope not, but if infections start to rise and they, they go maybe to like over 50 per 100,000 per week, I don't know where the exact uh, cutoff will be, then renewed lockdown measures might be needed, uh, but then we can take them, you know, in a really smart way. And we, you know, we don't have to say, you know, to everyone work from home, but we can say, you know, work from home if you're over 60 or work from home if you have a pre-existing disease, but the rest of you can go to work and keep a uh, one and a half meter distance from the, from the truly old, but the rest of you, you know, one and a half meters is probably not so much uh, necessary. So we could take really smart measures and minimize economic damage that way. And with that, I think it's time for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, is, uh, please add your question in the chat. I have a, I have a question because you stated that it's a non-natural death and like deaths that are physical is would you um would the virus be in the like in the um, the one that is not natural no the, the the virus would definitely be in the bodily failure uh, uh okay. category but uh, but but you see the, the the thing is why it's interesting to uh, to to compare to non natural death is because a non natural death we can actually av avoid relatively easily by taking precautionary measures, right? I mean, wearing a helmet when you get on a bicycle is something that's easily done. 
and it really doesn't hurt much, right? I mean, what is it? It may, it may hurt your feelings because you feel, you know, you feel silly. Uh, but it, uh, it's a very cheap measure to actually really reduce your risk, not only of death, but also of, uh, of brain damage. There are thousands of people actually brain damaged from bicycle uh, accidents every year. And people don't do that, right? And there's no law mandating a helmet for bicycles. Uh, so as a reference point to assess risk and to assess your own behavior and to assess your risk preferences, non-natural death is, is an interesting way to think about it, which is why I highlighted it. But for me, like you said, you can put up a helmet. Is The lockdown is the same thing as, as putting up a helmet, because if I just stay at home and don't see many people, the chance of me getting the virus is very little. Well, there's, of course, riding a bicycle is a, is, a, is a very personal risk to yourself. And you take the measures uh, only for yourself. So both the cost and the benefit of the measure are only yours. But the lockdown, of course, is, you know, it's the, the, the costs go to everyone and the benefits go to a few. And this makes it very political. Um, but we also have, you know, from non-natural deaths, we also have an example from that. Take, for example, the maximum speed limit, right, on, in cars. Um, I mean, obviously, we can eradicate almost every death from traffic if we reduce the speed that cars can go. But we don't do it. Uh, because there are obviously benefits to fast traffic, um, which uh, justify the death and 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 but uh, that balance has not yet been found for corona but we will find it over the coming months i think tara would like to ask a question yeah she just yeah. mentioned to me that she doesn't uh, her microphone is not working so tara could you answer your question in the chat and we can ask it for you um robin in the meantime i have another question because we did talk about ethics and different um ethical principles um could you maybe make explicit, uh, because you're trained as an economist as well, um, what kind of underlying ethical assumptions or what your framework is? Because I recognize a few, it, yeah, well, I personally, I recognize a strong utilitarian approach, um, but is it something that you recognize or would you consider this otherwise? Well, um, yes, I, I think, I think you're completely justified in saying it's a utilitarian approach. Um, um, bec because, you know, the thing is, the, the, you know, the thing about a pandemic is, it's not a, cha it's not a choice between good and evil. It's a choice between two evils. And so, so because, you know, we can go into lockdown forever. And it will definitely eradicate uh, the virus. But if we go into a global lockdown forever, people will die from a famine, right? So it's it's so it's so it's it's a, it's a choice between two evils. And I think it's a, so. The implicit assumption is is that we have an ethical duty to minimize the evil, because eradicating the evil or choosing the good, I don't see a good choice here. No, but uh, and I don't think anyone is arguing um, this, but it is helpful to make this explicit because you yeah. do use the well-being of the largest group, whereas um, part of an underlying ethical or another ethical principle can be to also protect um, those weakest. And that's a really interesting societal choice that we took this time, that we actually made, that there was a lot of commitment to protect those at largest risk of harm um, from a quite an altruistic uh, or just yeah or genuine commitment um, and that's very interesting if you also again from an economics perspective consider um, with all the outfall or economic consequences that you list um, this ties into a rationalization of certain choices um, so giving the greatest benefit to the greatest number of people the utilitarian principle yeah. includes maybe also the, the off trade against making sure yeah. that we also consider what is good for the weakest off or the most at risk yes but we do yes but there are limits to that and and this is not uh, unique to a pandemic uh, 
Um, um, we don't um, inoculate everyone for every possible disease because of cost. Um, there are medications that will, will not allow in the Netherlands because they're too expensive. Uh, so there are limits to, you know, there, there, be, 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 you know, this is just a physical because our, you know, our resources are limited, our knowledge is limited. So we will never be able to protect the weakest um, to the maximum extent possible, never. And this is this was true before the pandemic, and this is still true today. Yeah, um, and so also, there's also a, there's also a secondary point is that measures to protect the weakest also create new weak ones uh, not only just implicit in it being on a curve so you always need to have someone who's worse off no um, it's, it's not no 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 that's not it you actually off. make no it's not just a, a, a way of, of moving the curve but it's also actually making people weaker um, when people are, you know, when people have uh, economic duress like bankruptcy and debt and unemployment, we know their health outcomes, uh, you know, this doesn't happen overnight, obviously, but after a, after a couple of years, their health deteriorates. So, so, so we're actually making people also weaker. So it's, it's, so it's a very difficult trade-off. Yeah, and what is interesting about what your talk is, and then I will mention Tara's question because she sent it to me, um, yeah. is that the, um, what is important to realize is that the, with more information and with passing of time, you, we also enter different phases where the deliberations and the, the weighing of certain arguments may also shift depending on what the, the contextual factors are. And this is actually a nice bridge to Tara's question. If, uh, if you allow me to make this bridge this way. Um, she would like to know um, to what extent you think culture, uh, culture plays into choosing strategies. Um, so she is watching Sweden now um, and spend, or watching from Sweden now. So she's in Sweden at the moment, um, but spend the first few weeks of quarantine in the Netherlands. Swedes have such different cultural habits, she writes. I think I came into less contact with people here, also in the streets, in stores, even though there was no official lockdown. I can imagine that people have even more contact with each other in countries like France or Spain. What role does culture play? And if you allow me, I would like to extend it to, to um, a, a country case study that you didn't mention as explicit or elaborately in as Korea, for example, um, where many of the, well, the, the figures are actually much better than most European countries or the US. Yes, that's a, all right. Um, well, let me start with, uh, with the final one. It's true, of course, that um, uh, basically what, what Korea did and what Japan did is, is basically, of course, what we're starting to do now in Europe with the uh, testing and tracing um, and, the, and, the, and the mouse uh, uh, caps. When I should have put that in the presentation. When uh, Corona came to Europe and to the US, we were not as well prepared as Asia because Asia, of course, obviously they had the SARS and the MERS uh, experience uh, previously. So they had more testing equipment, they had more um, uh, personal protective equipment. So they were fully prepared. So we didn't have the option to do uh, the complete uh, testing and tracing and, and uh, that, the, that the Koreans did. So it's a, fa it's a fair point that should have been in my presentation. Um, with regards to the cultural factors, um, these play a large role in the, um, actually in the spreading of the epidemic, um, but not so much, well, and also in policy, but I think less so. So, for example, in, in Italy, for example, um, the very old uh, rarely live in social care homes. The very old um, are much more likely to actually live with their children. Um, uh, so they didn't have uh, like the social care home epidemic that we saw in the Netherlands or in Sweden, but we did. What we did see was an acceleration in death once the lockdown came, and the lockdown became like a like a super spreading uh, 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 event uh, because all of a sudden these elderly people and their and their children were living they had much more contact because now the, the young ones they were all of a sudden staying at home instead of going to work and to play tennis and, and 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 all other stuff so you see that those cultural traditions they have an effect on the 
uh, uh, on the spreading and also for example the whole um, the whole healthcare you know in, in 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 it as far as I can understand it the 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 barrier to entry into an ICU unit in Italy is much lower than in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we have quite strong triage before you go to the ICU. So we, you know, we see very few 80 plus year olds in the ICU in the Netherlands and much more in Italy. Um, uh, so, so, so there's, there's cultural differences um, uh, there uh, as well. And I think also in, you know, in, in public uh, policy, um, that's probably also reflected. Sarah, does this answer your question? Or if you want to respond, oh, so, uh, yeah, she's responding in the chat. So this confirms that culture matters, right? So simply saying strategy doesn't make any difference, um, maybe a little bit too fast or in, 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 in a conclusion. Well, I wouldn't say that because culture isn't policy, culture isn't strategy. Um, um, so, uh, I mean, culture, because we've seen that policy doesn't really make a difference, right? And we, of course, we do know that culture influences strategy, but strategy itself makes little, at least thus far, it makes little differences thus far. So, for, for those who are interested, Le Lancet published a few days ago an overview of different policies and their impacts uh, on the coronavirus outbreak based on primarily observational data. Um, it is the largest systematic review we have. I will put it in the chat for anyone who is interested in the in the scientific evaluation of different strategies that countries can employ. Um, who can I? Who can we give the floor for Brittany, the next question? Brittany had a question, oh, but she wants us to read it for her. Why did the hard lockdown in Minnesota lead to more deaths than the soft lockdown in Dakota, in South Dakota? Oh, I do. I think well. I think a lot of the of the differences between countries they they they, they come down more to uh, to luck and circumstance and demographics and uh, culture. We've said that before. Um, so I don't think there's 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 actually a cause where you can actually say you know there's a very strong causation from you know we had this and therefore we had that. Um, I think a, lo a lot of it is pure luck. Um, in the Netherlands, we had obviously we had carnival, we had um, uh, winter sports. Um, in you know, in 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 France, they had one enormous super spreading event in a church. Um, the same in uh, in Iran. Um, so some of it is just uh, pure luck. So there's not always uh, so. So it's just at, at least at this point. Uh, still early days. It, it's just a statistical noise. So I, I've, so so I, so so basically, the, the the reason I showed it is 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 not because I think a soft lockdown is better than what they did in Minnesota, uh, but just um, uh, to show that um, uh, you know it, it, the, the the policy probably didn't matter much. I will also in the chat include because. And another very interesting case study um, based in the US is for the, um, the Black Death um, and the policies that different cities took. And there you see that policies did matter in the speed and the, of the, so, yes. that, wow. so there are many interesting case studies to look at. So I will just flag a few. Um, yes. I would like to, that study I would like to comment on. Um, um, uh, first, I've, I've seen very good, um, reviews that say uh, the the article itself uh, the, the the way they treat the data is, is is can be criticized strongly let me put it that way but also I think it's incomparable because the 1918 pandemic um, was more deadly and is specifically more deadly for people at working age so between 20 and 50 um and um uh, which is completely different and so the economic effects when you actually when you know when the virus kills the economically active it's completely different to the virus killing the economically inactive so i don't think i'm i'm not sure if it's a if it's a study that we can project on today well the interesting thing is that we are we are talking now with the advantage of hindsight even though the um, well, it's just only a few months, but the lessons that we learned from the past, we now, we applied here, 
And now there is a time indeed to start evaluating to the extent to which is necessary. But many of the questions that we can answer now, we couldn't answer two months ago. True. And I think you need to take this into account with direction of policies, especially in the early phase, because it's easier to, and that's also the downside of public health. As soon as it helps, people start to question why we did it. Yeah. Um, and I do think we're entering this phase too at the moment. Um, but having said that, I personally, I fully, of course, agree with the fact that we need to reevaluate and, and having more information, we can, um, again, reassess the weighing of arguments to determine the, the way forward. Um, yeah. there, is, there was also a question from Wally. Uh, Wally, do you want to ask your question yourself? I will unmute you. Oh, I can, I can see his okay, question. Well, yeah, I was interested uh, what you think worked better, the soft lockdown in Sweden or the hard lockdown in the rest of Europe? Well, I think it's too early to tell. Um, if we look at the data, there's not really that much difference. Uh, of course, we will know probably in a couple of years, but also um, I always think, thank God for Sweden, because the, the fact that we have a counterfactual is a public good of enormous value. Uh, this is, you know, the things that we learn from the different approaches in Sweden compared to the rest of Europe, the things we learn from that is something that will be of value to our children and grandchildren for decades, maybe centuries to come. So this is also why I always say that, you know, you know when you're a policymaker or a politician or a, or a prime minister in these circumstances, you know, you like you're, 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 you make maybe a thousand different decisions, right? And you know that from those thousand decisions, 50 or 100 are probably wrong. Uh, this is the, the public health paradox that Joyce just said, 100 are probably wrong. Um, and if you had a different prime ministers, there would still be a hundred decisions that were wrong. There might be different hundred ones, but there'll still be a hundred wrong decisions. So uh, even if a decision is turns out to be wrong with hindsight, um, um, we can still not put blame on them because because we, we everyone would make mistakes. Um, um, uh, in these situations, and it doesn't really matter because every every right decision and every wrong decision, it will always create value in the sense that it creates a public good in the form of knowledge, in better prepare, uh, better preparation next time, in better policy next week, next month, and in the decade to come. So I'm happy about Sweden. But for an individualist, if you have your own restaurant you would rather have of course the Swedish approach than the Dutch approach so that's also a difference that on an individual level versus yes. helping the whole society of course yeah Victor you want to ask a question or you or you just turned on your your camera because it's nicer <laughs> there you go Do you guys hear Victor? Do you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> All right, good. Um, I was wondering if you took into consideration that there was a, a type of super spreading event uh, uh, that occurred just uh, before the outbreak uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, which was, of course, Carnival, and I live in Brabant, and I know how Carnival goes, and it's very much fun, uh, and it's uh, a, it would be a feast for a virus to spread there, which which actually happened. That was why it, we had this uh, um, large outbreak here, especially around Den Bosch, which, of course, didn't happen in Sweden. So that was maybe also uh, an incentive, um, and which was not known at the time but maybe also an incentive that uh, was playing a role in a lot of people's heads well we had Brabant and just just after after um, uh, Carnival uh, and one of the first patients actually went there so that was taken into consideration I guess in the policy making by the Dutch government which was something the Swedish government would not have to take with them 
Um, and what are you? What are your thoughts on that? No, I think it's a. I think it's a. I think it's a. Well, at least it's a fair hypothesis. Of course, we can see the effect of super spreading event in that excess death slide I showed between Sweden and Netherlands because. You know, in, in the Netherlands, it's much cheaper, uh, steeper, the curve, and it goes to a higher level. Um, so we can see the effect of the super spreading in the Netherlands, which Sweden didn't have. Um, uh, but I'm not sure it played a role in the, in the Netherlands in the sense that um, the, the authorities in the Netherlands, they said, you know, carnival is not really a danger. Yeah, yeah, but on the other hand, they also said, well, uh, yeah, Van Dissel said, well, uh, we can still have the Horeca open and then 24 hours later, we're going to close them within half an hour. That, that, that's, that's, that's also um, uh, um, a, a bit of dry kontrigheid, I guess. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, true. It's true, but it's difficult. I mean, it's really difficult. I mean, we, we, we know, of course, about, um, we know that in, um, in Denmark, the Danish uh, Jaap van Dissel uh, basically uh, advised do it the Sweden way, and the uh, and the Danish Prime Minister refused and uh, opted for quite a hard lockdown. And uh, of course, we saw the same in um, uh, in the UK, where you know they were on this herd immunity track for a very long time, um, and then it you know it twisted like that. And I think it's like a a fog of war type situation. Yeah. You know, where everyone is in this enormous pressure cooker, and you have uh, all this uh, all this information, a lot of which is non-information. Yeah. Um, oh, and a strong political influence. So yes, there is information, but there were very clear political choices made in the UK to go into a certain direction, and that's what we also see is how how much influence political views have on the interpretation and appreciation of evidence. Um, so especially, yeah, herd immunity in the UK is a really interesting one in that respect. Um, also that how the government has shifted its position after the prime minister became ill himself. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping in, but I know Rose and I, we were chatting about the time. Um, yeah, we're, we're... It is 10 past eight. Um, so we do need to wrap up, um, at least for those who want to leave, for those who want to continue the conversation, uh, well, we're here for a little while to so stick around. Um, for now, we'd like to, before we move into the after talk session, thank you, Robin, for joining us. Uh, well, my pleasure. Very thought provoking, as you can tell by the discussions we've had after. Um, yep. There are a few thank yous in the in the chat. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>